and welcome to The Search with Lisa. If this is your first time here, I cover unsolved cases, missing, murder, and I even dabble in with trafficking. I hope that this episode today finds your interest, and if so, please make sure to hit the subscribe button and notifications so you don't miss our uploads every Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. If you are a return searcher, thank you so much. That is what is helping our community grow and help find justice. Guys, it takes a village. It takes so many. And all it takes is one person to hear this story. So please share it out. And I hope today's episode resonates and you can share it. And you never know who's going to hear it and go, I know something else. It's actually a different type of story, guys, that I want to get into today. So like I said, get relaxed, sit back, and at the end, please make sure to leave your opinion or comment of what you think could have happened on this story. There's many theories that's been out there. Also, I want to tell my new people, if you would like to please join us when we upload at 8 p.m. because I set it on premiere that way we all can be together while we watch and I think it just helps build a bond within our community of the search and I think that that's what we need even extra to help these cases they need justice so with that being said let's dive in and Let's get into this, okay? So today, guys, we are going to be talking about Thomas and Eileen Lonergan. I want to give you a little detail about them. Eileen Cassidy Haynes was her original name before she got married. She was born on March 3rd, 1969. Thomas Joseph Lonergan was born on December 28th, 1964. So about four to five year difference or so. Oddly enough, they both went to the University of Louisiana. They lived in Baton Rouge, where they met was actually at the university. So the fact that they always lived in Baton Rouge was kind of, you know, neat. But they ended up getting married in 1988 in Jefferson, Texas. So they had finished schools, did what they needed to do, kind of finding their way. They both were very intelligent people, very deep thinking people, very wanting to be nurturers, helpers, work with the community, very spiritual, adventurous, things of that nature. So they went well together. Eileen was a little more into her community help, doing just a little extra. And anyway, she is the one that came up with the idea that they were going to join the Peace Corps. They decided that they would go over the Peace Corps and this would be in 1996-ish, okay, that they would go over there, do two years. Now, what I want to talk about is they had just done their two years of their Peace Corps tour. And that was in Funafuti, in a small, like, South Pacific island nation of Tuvalu. I hope that I'm pronouncing that right. And then where they worked in Fiji, basically. I think everybody's kind of familiar more with Fiji. As they were finishing up these two years, that's a big adjustment because now they're getting ready to pack up and go on back home. They were going to head on back to actually Louisiana. That's where their family was at and that's where they were going to go. So after doing that type of work, and living that type of lifestyle, you know, it's kind of like a shocking or really a, a deep thinking of what now are we going to do? We've lived this type of lifestyle 
and now we're going back. And this was something that I think really weighed on Tom. Eileen really just went with it, felt things were going to work out. She was very alive on the inside. You know, everybody worries, but did not allow it to weigh her down. One thing that they loved to do was scuba dive, okay? That was one of the things they did, and they had done it in many places around the world, you know, where they're from, down. I mean, just they were very experienced in scuba diving, and that was something that they bonded on and did well together. On their way back, this would now be around January. They're in the month of January of 1998. So like I said, they had been over there in that area since 95-ish, 96. So they complete two years. On their way back, they were looking forward to going and doing one of the dives that they had been looking forward to. And that was in the North Queensland in Australia. So on January 25th, 1998, the Lonergans were scuba diving with a group. So they actually like took this boat out. They weren't by themselves. They went out with a boat with a group at St. Crispin's Reef, all right, in Australia, which is the Great Barrier Reef. If you haven't heard of it, it's actually talked about a lot. You'll hear people, especially people that do a lot of scuba diving and have kind of like these goals that they would love to do. You definitely hear about Australia's Great Barrier Reef. This day on January 25th, 1998, they decide that they are going out with a group at St. Crispin's Reef in Australia's Great Barrier Reef. They're on this boat and it was ran by a company the Outer Edge, and Jack Nuren was the actual captain of the boat. Now, there was about 26 people that were going out with them that day. It wasn't like they went out by themselves. That day they go out, it is calm. The waters are actually great for scuba diving. So this couldn't have been any better. Now, they were known on the boat, like with the company that they were going out with, that they were experienced divers. All right, so they actually prepared extra tanks, like uh, bigger tanks, to be out longer. They kind of got a, like, did a little extra than what some on there due to their experience. And in fact, they had actually were in full wetsuits, like, full gear, a little more than what you would do to because of the temperatures that day. They just happened to be a little extra warmer. And so they were just really over-prepared, I should say. So that day, they go out and everything seems nice. So how this works is people go out. Every time they go out, when they jump off, it's logged in, they come back in, log back in right so the course the captain is on there and then he has his helpers you know his mates on there to help him with doing all this so it's kind of like so they can keep a log of like in and out for safety purposes so that day they had went out and they had done a few dives out and of course it was time to start coming back in all right so that day when they were coming back in, they loaded people on the boat and had to, of course, do a head count as people were coming back in and make sure everybody's on the boat before they leave the area. They do their head count and head back in. They were staying at, I think they call it like a hostel or, a, you know, a base, a hotel. Okay. Uh, and so when they headed back in, they had been brought over like with a shuttle. So they had paid for a round trip. So, you know, those places know like when the, you know, how it works, what time they're coming back in. So the bus comes and, or the shuttle, whatever you want to call it, comes to pick them up. And 
notices that the longer mints are not there. He kind of is like, you know, asking kind of around, like, have you seen them? And the, I believe the actual captain of it said, I wouldn't worry too much. They probably, you know, got another, you know, way back to the hotel and you'll see them then. Like, basically, kind of no worries. They felt everybody had been counted for. No worries. Well, there needed to be worries. Okay? There needed to be worries. <sighs> So, that night, nothing had really been said, okay? Because, remember, they are on their way, like, back home. They are not familiar. They are not really known in this area or anything like that. It was January 27th, two days later, after a bag containing their belongings was found on board the dive boat. They look and they notice like the luggage, you know, had not been picked up. And so they basically decided to open it up and start looking in it. And that's when they noticed that there was a wallet with cash there, you know, all their information, passports, like just everything that, that they needed and nothing had been picked up. Well, they start putting two and two. They start thinking about how they were questioned about where they were on getting on the shuttle. And now two days later, so they call over to the hotel to see if they're there. And when they called over at the hotel and they were like, no, we have not seen them. They let them know we found the bags. I'm going to tell you, the people over at the hotel were very mad. Remember, they are the ones that sent the shuttle over there and were kind of just like, oh, don't, you know, kind of don't worry, you know, that everything's okay. And so right away, they called their, their 911. They called the police to let them know that something, you know, was not right and let them know what they knew right then a massive air and like sea search took place over the following three days now we're getting into february they're not seeing anything in february in 1998 so you know we're just talking not too much longer a woman's wetsuit matching eileen's size washed up ashore on North Queensland. Upon looking at it and examining it, the barnacle, I guess, growth on the wetsuit was determined it had likely been submerged in the ocean since January. Okay. So I guess, you know, just by seeing it, it also had just smaller tears along like the rear end side of it, the armpit area. The examiner had say resulted probably like from getting like contact like with corals, like grabbing them. That's what it almost kind of looked like. Not like an attack, you know, like something ripped it. Literally like maybe just a coral getting snagged on something, whether it was on her at the time it happened or not. What I want to say is their bank accounts were never touched, no insurance policies, nothing, nothing of that had been touched. So everything is still like they're missing out there. Remember we talked about the head count? Yeah. Well, yeah, somebody either didn't do a count or they don't know how to count. Now, they said that that day after they did talk to people also on the boat, that that day when they were getting in, they count people going out, coming in. That then when they were doing the last dives and coming back in, that they had counted. And a couple had actually gone back in for a few and then came back up and was believed to have been counted twice. Which is where the mix-up happened. So... That mix-up was a real big mix-up. I want to kind of go back to the thinking and where their minds were on this trip. Like I said, 
You know, they were leaving after being two years on the Peace Corps. These people were also very experienced in diving. They knew the rules. Also, though, because they were more experienced, they had more oxygen. They could go a little further. So, you know, did they go a little too far and something go wrong and it just was unable to be seen? I don't know. But we will talk about that in a minute. What I want to tell you is when they got into their stuff, meaning their clothes, things like that, they actually had their diaries. Both of them were avid writers and journals. They journaled everything. And I mean, they, when they both wrote, these were intelligent I just can't say it enough. They journaled a lot of all their thoughts up right up until going on this trip. And I want to talk about these diaries. They were really deep thinkers, like I've said. By looking at these diaries, there was a little more to the marriage than what we thought. We thought everything was really great. When they got into Tom's, seemed to be depressed, it seemed reading into it. And Eileen's own writing in hers says she was concerned with Tom's apparent death wish. Writing two weeks before their fateful trip that he wished to die a quick and peaceful death. And that Tom's not suicidal but he's got a death wish that could lead him in what he desired and I could get caught in that. She was concerned. She was very concerned. The parents actually disputed this suspicion and said the entries were taken way out of context. It just kind of starts to open up another avenue of what was going on there. With the findings of of their things. They were kind of on different thinking patterns, I should say. Both had spoke about not enjoying their jobs, and Eileen spoke about how our lives are so intertwined now. We are hardly two individuals. Where we are now goes beyond dependence, beyond love. It was like they were as one, like so codependent, and I don't think that Eileen really wanted that. The love part, of course, and feeling as one, but also, like I told you at the beginning, Eileen was this free spirit, like independence, and enjoyed doing certain things. So the fact that he is thinking on this deeper level, like he's achieved everything, and like I, I could go now, I've done, did everything I've wanted to do, and see, there was also talk of on one of their past experiences on their dive. They actually had like a come to Jesus meeting in the in the ocean, if you know what I mean. Apparently, they had come face to face with a certain shark. Said it was so close they could have reached out and touched it. It's too close for me. But he said he looked right into the eyes of that shark. He said it was like such a spiritual feeling. And it was so, I guess, life-changing. So it was after this experience that he wrote this, okay? And that Eileen was noticing that he was making some really deep and dark type of comments like I just read you. I don't think she was totally feeling that vibe. I know he was definitely stressing going back home and what the life was going to be like there. All this was going on like Peace Corps was over. It's almost like back to reality. Okay. Which is why they went on this last adventure. One of the things that they wanted to do from what I have read is that night we talked about how in February they did find stuff washing up that was verifying that it was hers. But this is some things that they talked about. That night, of course, things got cold. It was nice during the day, but things got cold, even though they did have extra. 
but there was boats out there in that area. They said that that night that they didn't hear anybody like hollering, trying to get anybody's attention. There was nothing like this, okay? So that was kind of odd of how they went missing in this area, but there was boats that stayed out there all night. Of course, they didn't know anybody was missing and looking, but... You know, they were, of course, avid swimmers. They had enough oxygen on them. They had things. Why didn't they, like, go to the boats and, like, hey, we got left behind? You know, I'm not sure about that. Like I said, they had called a lot of people to do a lot of searches. They didn't find any signs of them. We did have the wet suits wash up. Three months later, the family flew out there. They wanted to see and go for themselves to see what happened and kind of put their selves there. At that time, they went ahead and conducted a funeral. They had come to terms that whatever had happened, that they were gone, that they needed to put their souls to rest, to say the least. The coroner was saying, that the couple probably died either from exposure, drowning, or shark attack, you know, to the dehydration, you know, there there was different things that they felt. There were some conspiracy theories ranging from that they were faking their own deaths to a murder-suicide, to a suicide pack, were discussed in weeks and months following the tragedy. But both Tom and Eileen had kept those personal journals like we talked about, which were discovered, like I told you. And even though the contents was disturbing, they don't feel that it was that. These were more like theories. So, like I said, at three months afterwards, there had been all the theories due to the journal reading because there was boats out there. There was things washing up. Also, people had said they thought they had seen them. But all that has kind of been washed away and said to be, no, none of that. They lost their lives out at sea. Six months later, they actually found a wetsuit that was actually the same exact size of hers, a Port Douglas, like a large area, I want to say probably about 75 miles from Fish City, which is where they were last at. Like I said, with things washing up, they definitely know that they were there at sea. Now, something interesting that they did find. Several months after the disappearance, a fisherman found a dive slate, which a slate is something that you can write on, almost like if you're diving together and you're trying to communicate, you can write on it in the water, things like that. So they had actually found it several months later, and this was on Monday, January 26, 1998, meaning they wrote 8 a.m. To anyone who can help us, we have been abandoned and we are on Court Reef by MV Outer Edge, 25 January 98, 3 p.m. Please help us. Come to rescue us before we die. Help. Unfortunately, that was found many months later, but the slate is really what confirmed it, that they were not out there trying to fake their death. They were left behind, and do we know exactly what happened to them on this event I, we know that that night that they tried to get help that looks like that they went out on the 25th and they wrote on there that it was monday january 26 at 8 a.m so that's so we know that they made it through the night and then they've said that they were abandoned so it sounds like to them that that maybe they were just out 
And when they came back in, because maybe they were a little further out, I don't know. They did feel abandoned, like that the ship took off too quick. That is what was wrote on this slate. Like I said, it says, please help us. Come rescue us before we die. Help. Which is the last thing, unfortunately, they seen. Over the next weeks, the couple's dive jackets, their tanks, one of Eileen's fins also washed up. None of them showed damage and suggested their lives had come to like any violent end. We talked about the conspiracy theories. The bottom line is we don't know exactly what happened, but the coroners definitely just suspect that they either dehydrated, drowned, just, you know, they couldn't tread forever. It's a dangerous place out there in the water. Also, the temperatures got down. I want to say that I read at one time 41 degrees to be exact. I want to tell you a little bit about the boat skipper, Jeffrey Naren. He was actually charged with manslaughter, but was found not guilty by a jury. His company, Outer Edge, pleaded guilty to negligence and went out of business. The Outer Edge skipper, Jeffrey Naren, he did not feel, of course, good about this. Who would? The Queensland government also introduced a strict new regulation because of this due to the state's dive industry. A year after the disappearance, they got requiring things like mandatory counts and lookouts who remain on the boat during the dives so it was very interesting how because of this that they really got things going on the regulations and ran them up which is a great thing because hopefully now it has definitely saved and prevented this happening an interesting thing about this story is there was actually a movie made in 2003 called Open Water. It won the Best Thriller of Golden Trailer Award and Blanchard won Best Actress for her performance at the Saturn Awards. That would be Blanchard Ryan, by the way, and Daniel Travis, who starred in it. In 2018, Eileen's mother, Kathy Haynes, told the Courier Mail on the 20th anniversary year of the couple's disappearance that she held no ill will towards Australia. The family also feels nothing but sympathy towards Skipper Naren, who passed away in 2015 and believed it was right that he wasn't prosecuted over the tragedy. Like I said, he wasn't prosecuted, but he did, of course, have his business shut down. This story really had a lot of twisted turns to it, but overall, it was, I really feel, a tragic accident, a simple miscount. Maybe they were out too long. And I think the diaries were just really just taken out of context. You know, they probably were having some deep things and very like, kind of scared coming back after two years of being, you know, in, in Fiji doing these works and Peace Corps and stuff. And just, you know, putting their ideals out there, a little deep thinking. But once they got back, probably would have snapped into things. And unfortunately, that did not happen. So with all the theories being said, I just think more than likely something they love to do is where their life ended and uh, tragically too soon. What I like to do at the end of every episode is I like to present a ribbon. So a prayer for justice for the families. In this situation, I believe we know where they are at. So this is a simple prayer for the family that we acknowledge their loss and we thank you for sharing their story but to also be able to get laws more stricken and prevent this from happening. So on top here, this is the date they got married, June 24th, 1988. And this is the year of the last time they were seen, January 25th, 1998. If 
everybody, I want to thank you for being here tonight and allowing me to share this story with you. If for some reason you do know something about this story, please share it. Tell me what you think maybe could have happened, and I will see you on the next search. Good night, everybody. Thank you.